All right, there we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Julie. I'm the event manager at Roundabout Books. So hopefully when we are having live events again, you can come in and say hi. Um, we are recording this for YouTube, so we hope more people can see it. Uh, joining us tonight is author Philip Margolin, who uh, splits his time, it sounds like right now, between Portland and Bend. Um, criminal defense attorney, prolific author, and tonight he's going to talk with us about uh, how to write a novel. Um, we're going to have questions at the end, and I think this is going to be really fun. This is different than what we normally do when it comes to a book event. So I hope that there's some people out there who have thought about writing a novel and can take what Phil's going to tell us and go for it. So, um, Phil, I'm going to hand it over to you and, you know, take it away. Hi. So this is very weird. Um, uh, I was right in the middle of a book tour for A Reasonable Doubt, which is my latest novel, when all the coronavirus stuff hit. And uh, I had done a in-store appearances in Arizona, um, Houston, Dallas, and then everything went poof. So I was supposed to do um, events in Central Oregon, and um, did, I've been in communication with the bookstores there, and I said, well, what, what can we do? So uh, they said, let's try to do this uh, over the internet. So I've never done this before. It's very weird for me. Usually I have a group of people sitting out there. Uh, normally when I do a talk uh, and I have a book out, uh, what I do is I, I talk about where I got the idea for the book and, um, you know, how I became a writer and various other things. But I thought with the virus and everything, and people social distancing and quarantining that there might be somebody or more than one who decide to use this time alone to write a, a book. And uh, over the years, I have given this talk that I'm going to give tonight to writers conferences. I'm doing it at the Willamette Writers Conference this year, also over a TV or Zoom or whatever this is. I'm very old, so this is Technology is very weird for me, um, but I've done it, oh, I don't know, over the years at, at conferences around the country, uh, and it's basically how to write a novel in your spare time, because uh, I've had two writing careers. My first uh, two books came out in the 1970, 1978 and 81, uh, and, and there's a, it was very fortunate for this purpose, because I wrote my first two books on a typewriter. So at the end of the uh, talk, I'm going to do what's actually probably the most important part, and that's to talk about how a professional writer rewrites, which is really different. And uh, uh, because I had a typewriter now, when I, I'm on my 25th book I'm working on, and uh, the first thing I do in the morning when I start working, uh, you know, start working, I put my computer on and I read what I wrote the day before and then I'll delete stuff or shift stuff around. So the way it originally looked has gone up in smoke, but um, I actually was able to keep a whole bunch of first pages from my second novel. Uh, so that's going to be very useful. And at the end, I'm going to go over uh, and read these to show you how a professional writer rewrites. So uh, <clears throat> I only had, I'm basically self-taught. I only had one writing course in college. I got a C plus in creative writings, which that wasn't very encouraging. Um, so everything I, I know, you're going to know by the end of this hour or so. Uh, and uh, uh, the first thing I always want to tell people when I give this talk is what I say is not gospel. Um, you know, this is, these are things that have helped me write novels. Uh, and one of the neat things about writing is unlike math, where there's just one way, if it's two plus two and you say five, you're wrong. Uh, but with writing any method that gets you from page one, to the end of the book is brilliant. So there's a lot of debate, should you use outlines, not use outlines. 
really doesn't matter uh, what you do as long as you start the book on page one and you get to the last page and write the end. But these are just things that I have found really work well for me. And if for some reason, you know, they don't work for you, that's fine. I, I remember I had a group of high school kids that I was talking to about writing. And uh, I, I mentioned that I use outlines and how great outlines are. And as I talked about outlines, this one girl in the group looked panic stricken. I thought she was going to have a heart attack. And finally, she just burst out and said, I can't do an outline. I said, don't, don't do an outline. I said, I like outlines. If you don't like outlines, don't do it. So again, just because a professional writer with, you know, a ton of New York Times bestsellers tells you this is what they do, doesn't mean that you have to do it, but hopefully this will help you. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how to avoid writer's block, how to deal with the problem of writing a novel when you don't have a lot of time, because I had wrote my first uh, five New York Times bestsellers with a uh, full-time law practice doing death penalty murder cases and also raising two kids. So I did not have a lot of time to write the books and I had to figure out a way to, to, uh, to do that. So I'm going to give you, uh, uh, you know, uh, tell you a little bit about how you can do time management if you have a full-time job or you're raising kids and still write a book. And then, um, I'll give you a framework for how to write a novel from beginning to end. Uh, now, a couple of general things, and, and uh, this is one thing I did get from my writing class that I did take, and that is that the professor said writing is writing, and by that he meant uh, some people think unless you're going to write great literature, you're not really a writer. You know, if, if you're not, uh, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre, you're, you're somehow not worthy of calling yourself a writer. Uh, quite frankly, um, if you're writing romance novels, you know, timeless literature, uh, tough guy detective stories, whatever you're doing, if you're, you're a writer. And uh, I don't think Tolstoy had any more fun than I do. I don't write nearly as well as Tolstoy, and I, I re recognize that. And my books aren't as meaningful as, as uh, you know, War and Peace. But... Um, I get as much fun out of writing and that's what you should be doing. Uh, it, you know, if you're not enjoying it, you shouldn't be really doing it. You know, and for me, I can't wait to get up every morning. And uh, when I'm in Portland, I run down to my office, I cut my law office and I can't wait to get to work. So uh, don't think that because you're not writing, you know, timeless literature, you're really not worthy of calling yourself a writer. The other thing is, and people don't realize it, writing's hard work. Um, it is also, a, it's not natural. It's a learned skill like uh, tennis or typing. And, um, you know, when Serena Williams took up tennis uh, and started to doing playing tennis, any mediocre JV guy in a, 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 in a, in a high school team would have killed her because she didn't know where to put her feet. She didn't know the right way to swing. She didn't know how to time the shot. But she got better and better by practicing. And that's the same thing with writing. So if you write and you send a book in and it gets rejected, uh, don't feel like you shouldn't keep doing it. Because if, I, if you saw the, my first couple, couple of efforts, um, you know, you'd be shocked that I've ever written a book that was published. Uh, but the more you do it, the better you get. And so I had a whole bunch of rejections before I actually got a book published. Um, and it's just by doing it a lot, I got better and better and better. It's the same thing with piano. You start playing piano, you're pretty awful. But if you practice, eventually you sound pretty decent. So uh, don't get discouraged if you write stuff that gets rejected. It may very well be that since you're starting out, it's garbage. You know, my, I, like I said, if you saw my first couple of novels, uh, you'd say, oh, my God, this guy can't write at all. And you'd be right. They were really bad. But you work at it, you get better. Um, the next thing I, I would like to talk about is time. And this is directed at people that maybe have a full-time job or uh, are raising kids and have very little time to write. So when I'm on tour, it was not unusual for me 
to have somebody come up while I'm signing books and say, hey, I got a great idea for a novel. I said, oh, uh, you know, are you working on this? Oh, no, no, I don't have the time to do it. I thought you might be interested. And I always tell them this is ridiculous. It's your idea. You should write it. Uh, and this idea that you don't have time is, is not true. So here's a couple of things about time. Uh, a lot of people think that if they start a novel in, uh, in January, that they have to finish it by, uh, you know, Christmas time, by December. But if you don't have a contract with a deadline, <clears throat> uh, just check your actuarial table. That'll tell you how long you have to write the book. You, have a, you can do it until you drop dead. Uh, Scott Turow wrote Presumed Innocent, which was the first massive legal thriller. He's the one that started the genre. It took 12 years to write Presumed Innocent. And I can't remember his name. Edward Jones, I think, won a Pulitzer Prize um, for the known world. Mm -hmm. And it took him 12 years to write the book. So uh, I have one book that took me 30 years. Now, that's because I'm really old, but... Uh, you know, it, you don't have to put any artificial time limit on what you're doing unless, like I said, you've actually got a contract that has a deadline. But if you haven't published yet, you don't. So don't panic. Take as much time as you need to get a good product. Uh, another thing to think about is this. If you wrote one page a day, you would have a 365-page book by the end of the year. If you wrote two pages a day, you'd have War and Peace. So you can write a huge amount of manuscript with very little time, uh, as long as you're sort of religious about it, as long as you do it. Uh, when I was writing full-time, or pardon me, when I was writing with a full-time job, I would get up early on Saturday and Sunday, uh, way before the rest of the family was up, and I would write four hours on Saturday and four hours on Sunday. And uh, if you add that up, four plus four is eight. And what's your typical work day? An eight-hour day, right? So I was able to get a whole day of writing on my book each week by getting up early on Saturday and Sunday. And so, uh, again, you can do quite a bit of work with a limited amount of time. The thing is that you do really have to stick to it. You have to, you have to be religious about it because... Uh, if you decide on Saturday, well, I'm going to sleep late or, uh, you know, well, this Saturday I'm going to do something different, uh, then you won't get, get it done. But as, as long as you're really excited about your book and you do get yourself a bit of a schedule, you can do a lot even with a full-time job. Um, let me see. All right. So now I'm going to tell you about all I you need to – to know about writing a book. And I learned this from my first published short story. So, um, <clears throat> and the, I write thrillers, but I think this also translates into other types of literature. Uh, the first book, I, uh, the first short story I sold was back in the 1970s. And it was called The Girl in the Yellow Bikini. And before that, that uh, short story, I had written a number of um, science fiction short stories, people with plaid eyeballs and really bizarre plots uh, that, you know, just were rejected very, very, very quickly by the science fiction magazines. So I finally, after a number of rejections, decided that I should change genres. And by that time, I had a full-time law practice and done some murder cases. And I thought, well, I'll try to write a crime short story. So I wrote a short story called The Girl in the Yellow Bikini, and the main character is a young guy. He's in a troubled marriage, and uh, <clears throat> one day uh, he gets fired from his job, very depressed, comes home, tells his wife, and she leaves him. So this guy's in the depths of despair, and he's out of work. His wife's left him. Uh, he's just really miserable, and <clears throat> his house is sort of up on a hill. And it overlooks another house with a big uh, front yard. And it's a vacant house until this very attractive uh, woman moves in and she sunbathes in a yellow bikini. And so at first he sort of watches her as a voyeur, 
but then he gets sort of tired of doing that and he decides to play a game and the, the game is to follow her around like a detective or a stalker depending on how you want to look at it uh, just to find out everything he can find out about her without her knowing and uh, at the by the end of the short story there's been a double murder blackmail plot and a bunch of other stuff that you didn't see when you started reading the book so here's the two things that i've learned in it and when you next time you see a movie or read a book see if this doesn't work for you the first thing is you have to have empathetic characters these are characters that your readers relate to now <clears throat> Very few people, probably nobody you know, has plaid eyeballs. So you got some guy with a weird science fiction story with plaid eyeballs, it's really hard to relate. But most people uh, have either been fired from a job or have had trouble getting a job. Um, most people have had some kind of a trouble with their love life. You know, maybe in junior high, your girlfriend broke up with you. So everything that happened, not everything, but things that happened to my main character are things that, you're, uh, that the reader could relate to. And so you would say, oh, my gosh, you know, I remember when I got laid off. I wonder what's going to happen to this guy. I wonder if he'll get another job. Or, oh, my goodness, his wife left him. That's terrible. I remember when I had trouble with my marriage. So you want to have characters that have problems that the reader can relate to because then they're going to want to find out what happens to this person. The other thing, you want nonlinear plots. Uh, if your reader can figure out in chapter one who the killer is or whether or not John and Mary are going to get married at the end of the book, why would they want to read it? You know, if you know what's going to happen, you put the book down, you get another book where, where you don't. So, Again, nonlinear plots. When you started reading Girl in the Yellow Bikini, it was about this guy who was out of work and having love problems, and there's this really attractive woman across the street, and you don't anticipate that there's going to be murder, blackmail, and various other things. Um, so, again, you want to have a story that has twists, turns, and a lot of surprises. So that's just the basics. Uh, how do you start a novel? Well, this is the hardest part for me. Uh, I'm on my 25th novel, and every time I finish a book, I get scared to death that I'm not going to be able to think up an idea that's going to be complex enough for a 400-page book. So most ideas are tiny. You know, uh, in, in uh, A Reasonable Doubt, uh, I got the idea, I love magic, and back in the 1970s, I'd, I'd never seen a magician, and they had a show on one night on ABC where they had magicians, and I just got hooked. I couldn't figure out how they made all these people disappear and reappear and stuff, so I've always loved magic, and I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if I had a magician who was doing an incredible David Copperfield-like illusion, and he was murdered in front of a full house and you didn't know who the killer was. So everyone in the audience sees the murder, but nobody knows who, who done it. And so it was really fun. I thought, okay, I'm gonna have to learn how to make a big magic illusion. I'm gonna have to figure out how the killer does it. But that's just tiny. That, that's not enough to fill up a 400 page book. That, that takes up a couple of chapters in in a reasonable doubt, but it doesn't fill up the whole thing. So again, getting an idea, all, all, all novels start with the writer getting some idea. They see something on TV or somebody says something at a, at a uh, uh, cocktail party and they say, wow, that, that's interesting. Maybe I could write a book about it. Uh, what I always tell people is, as soon as you get an idea, don't write. Think. Now, I've actually taken um, <clears throat> three years. My, my first huge bestseller was Gone But Not Forgotten. It took me three years to get from the idea to actually writing the book. 
Um, one of my most su other successful books is Executive Privilege. I got that idea in uh, 1995, but I didn't write the book until 2005. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> thinking and not writing is super important. Now, let me tell you why. Here's a great idea, okay? Fantastic idea. It's one of the best ideas anyone's ever come up with. There's a train load of atomic weapons that's going through Portland, Oregon. And terrorists hijack the train. Wow, nobody's ever had anything that great. So I get so excited, I don't think, and I write one of the best action scenes you've ever and I have the train, and I got black helicopters, and ninjas are coming down, and there's gunfights, karate fights. And at the end of this phenomenal action scene, the bad guys have the train. And then what? Well, why did they get the train? Uh, who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? Uh, how are they going to get the – how are the good guys going to get the atomic weapons back? So – because I didn't think, and I just started writing, 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 you get depressed because you can't move it past that action scene. And so after a while, I crumple up my fabulous chapter and I throw it in the garbage. So what you want to do is follow a system that I use when I get an idea, and I use this every time I get an idea, and it's, it's sort of like the uh, stuff you learn in journalism school, who, what, when, where, and how. So I'm going to give you a, an example. Uh, one of my books is called The Undertaker's Widow. And I got the idea for The Undertaker's Widow by watching a made-for-TV movie where a boy and girl made out on a beach. And it was a little like that famous scene, if you guys have ever seen From Here to Eternity. So the the couples rolling around, which I never thought was that sexy because you get sand in your swimsuit and then the, the cold water washes over you. So it looks pretty good on the screen. But I thought, well, this is, a, this is a interesting. I think I'm going to write a book with a scene like that. And that was the, the impetus. It's going to have a scene with two people making out on a beach. So the first thing I asked myself is uh, – <clears throat> who are the people? Who are these two people that are making out? And uh, I'd never written a story with a judge. So I decided that I was going to have one of the people be a judge. So I've got a judge making out on a beach with a woman. So the next question is, are these this man and woman married or are they not married? And I decided if if they were married, they probably wouldn't be making out. They'd be working on a crossword puzzle or, or reading a murder mystery. So I decided it'd be much more interesting if the judge was having an affair with this woman who was not his wife. So now all of a sudden, not only do I have two characters, a woman, a man who's a judge making out with a woman on a beach that he's not married to, but I've got ethical issues because a judge is supposed to be very ethical and moral and now he's cheating on his wife. So we've added some ethical issues into the book. Uh, the next question that I ask myself is, where is this beach? And I had two possibilities. One was Tillamook, where they have the cheese factory, or the Caribbean. And after a lot of thought, I decided that it would be much more exotic to have the beach that they're making out in the Caribbean. But how does an Oregon judge get to the Caribbean? Well, uh, I decided that some lawyer conferences take place in exotic locations, uh, like Hawaii or the Caribbean. And I thought, well, uh, maybe I'll have my judge invited to a conference in the Caribbean where uh, you know, where he's a speaker. So uh, just to tell you how truth is stranger than fiction, and I will do anything for my fans. You are the most important people in my life. And at 
great expense, uh, I decided I would have to go to a Caribbean island to do research so it would be real for you. I, I, so I went, I went to Jamaica, and when I checked in, uh, there was an American lawyer conference <laughs> in, in the love resort that I was at. So I really don't have a very good imagination. Uh, okay, so we got the people making out on the beach. We're in the Caribbean, and now we have a murder. <clears throat> and what happens is that the judge uh, is making out, and the woman that he's making out with jumps up, and she decides to run into the ocean. She runs into the ocean. The judge comes in. They're sort of kissing. They're swimming around. And a guy in scuba deer, gear comes up, grabs the woman, pulls her under, and murders her. Whoa. So that is my big scene. Uh, that's, you know, that's, that's the murder. But I decided to make this Caribbean island run by a dictator. A lot of drug trafficking going on. So the next question is, <clears throat> why was the killing done in such a weird way? Okay, and that's sort of my backstory and the story going forward, because it's a very strange way to murder someone. You'd have to know when the person was going to be at the beach. You'd have to get your scuba gear. If you think about it, <clears throat> it doesn't really make any sense to kill someone that way. So why were they killed that way? And then the big question is, what does the judge do? Because... <clears throat> Let's say he goes to the police. Let's say it wasn't a Caribbean Island corrupt policeman. And he just walks in and, you know, just imagine this happened in uh, Lincoln, in, the, in Cannon Beach. Okay? Guys, guys ju married judge making out with his mistress. She gets murdered in scuba gear. He goes walking to the police station and says, guys, <laughs> you'll never guess what happened. I, I, was, I was making out on the beach with my mistress, I, I am married, but this I'm cheating on my wife. And you'll never guess, some guy in scuba gear came up and drowned her. Well, what do you think is going to happen to the judge? One of two things, either he would be immediately thrown in a prison cell and charged with murder, or if they said, hey, we believe you, you're a judge, we, you, we know you tell the truth, what's the headline in the newspaper going to be the next day? Judge's mistress murdered in in love tryst, you know, so your, your marriage is on the rocks. Uh, <clears throat> your reputation is ruined. So what does the judge do? And of course, that's the story going forward. So that's a little bit of a idea of how I develop a little idea, boy and girl making that on the beach into a book length idea. And this does not happen um, in two seconds you know, like I just did, it, it usually takes place over months. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about outlining in a minute. But the first thing I want to talk about before I talk about outlining and how I developed the idea all the way into a book length novel is what I consider to be the most important part of a book. And that is the ending. Now, uh, <clears throat> You have to have a good idea to get your book off the ground. But I've always felt that if you have a really super clever idea, you've got to have a really brilliant, fabulous ending. And the ending is the most important part of any book. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read a book or, or seen a movie that starts off great and has a really dumb ending. What do you tell your friends? You know, I just read this book. It was okay, but the ending was really stupid. Well, you forget you love 90% of that book, but the ending left a sour taste in your mouth. Flip that over. How many of you seen a movie or read a book that was okay, but had a dynamite ending? What do you tell your friends? Oh, my God. When I found out the butler did it, my jaw dropped. I couldn't believe that. It was amazing. Well, you forget, most of the book wasn't really that good. So <clears throat> before I even start writing a single word, I have to know what the ending is. And that's the reason 
why uh, my first bestseller, uh, Gone But Not Forgotten, took three years before I started writing it. And that's the reason of 10 years for me <clears throat> with executive privilege, which has this, now I guess it doesn't sound as, as, as brilliant, but back in 95, the idea was, could the president of the United States be a serial killer? And uh, it was a great idea. I had scenes, I had characters, but I just couldn't figure out how, if the president was a murderer, how would he do it with the press all over him and secret service around him all the time? So it took me 10 years and I literally did not write a single word until I got that idea for the ending. And the ending's a doozy, but it took me quite a while before I got it. So for me, I will, no matter how good the idea, I literally will not write a single word in the book until I've got that ending. Now, the other thing about the ending is it's always good to know where you're going. So if I'm going to drive from Portland, from New York to, to uh, Portland, and I just decide to take off and I don't look at maps or anything, I could end up in the middle of the Mojave Desert and run out of gas and die. But if I say, okay, I'm going to go to Portland, then I can figure out where to stay, where gas stations and restaurants are, and I can make it safely there. And, uh, and this has happened to me a number of times, I may decide I don't want to go to Portland. I might get two thirds of the way across the country and, and uh, change my mind about the ending. And I've actually, my second book, The Last Innocent Man, which was actually, it was made into a movie. Um, I wrote that novel, had a complete book written and really thought it was boring. I just didn't like the ending. So I flipped a good part of the plot on its head added a character who had not been in the original manuscript and it turned out to be a terrific book. It's made into a movie with Ed Harris and it's been a New York Times bestseller. And, but I had to change the ending. But now it's your book. Since it's your book, you can do anything you want with it. But it does help to have an ending to start with. You can always change it if you want to, but knowing where you're headed really helps writing. Okay, so now I've got my really clever idea. I've got my really clever ending. And the next thing I do is an outline. And my outlines are not capital A, Roman numeral one. I call them a talking outline. What I do is I literally talk my way through the book. Now I do it on a computer, uh, but it takes me about one to three months to get the whole um, book written uh, or the whole outline written. And uh, the good thing about it is when I finish the outline, it's usually 25 to 40 pages, the book's written. It's in shorthand, but the whole book's done. Because, and as you're working on the outline, you're spending all this time, again, not writing, thinking. So when I do these outlines, I'll be in my office maybe six hours a day just thinking about the plot. And I will get new ideas. Uh, characters that I think would be terrific, I realize they're not going to work. Scenes that I thought when I was initially thinking would be great scenes, I realize they won't work here. Uh, I, I realize I have to add new characters. So as you're working on the outline, you're, you're, again, you're not writing, you're thinking, and you're immersed in the plot of your book for that entire length of time. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> uh, and here's a couple of things. Um, the, the good thing about the outline, which I sort of mentioned is, if you do an outline, it helps you to spot problems with the plot <clears throat> before you've written 300 pages. So uh, you start, if you just start writing and writing, you get 300 pages done and you realize that you made your killer right-handed and you realize that that plot won't work because if he's right-handed, he's not going to be able to, you know, reach the mantelpiece and grab the candelabra with his hand now you got to rip up the whole book and rewrite it. But if you're working on an outline, you can just say, oh, okay, he's got to be left hand instead of right hand. I'll just go back and change 
right to left, and now I've solved the problem. And all it's taken me is maybe a week uh, where I had this. And But if I'd written it, I would have had to tear up everything or rewrite everything. So that's the one good thing. You spot problems with the plot before you've written a lot. Uh, another thing is if you have a full-time job. Now, when I was, my, as I said, my first five novels I wrote uh, with, with a full-time law practice, and I think I did two or three death penalty murder cases while I was writing After Dark. So uh, <clears throat> there are times where I couldn't get to my book on the weekend because I was in trial. Well, let's say uh, if you're doing a death penalty case, you, you really have to put your entire effort into the case. So let's say that I finally finished the case, but I haven't, I haven't been working on the, the novel for a month. Well, if I don't have an outline, I'm going to have to reread, and this, this is when I'm doing, doing a part-time, I'm going to have to reread, let's say, 300 pages that I've written, and there goes my whole weekend. But I have my outline, I can read maybe the first 10 pages of the outline, and then maybe a couple of chapters, get right back into the book and not waste all that time. Okay, uh, the ending of a book's really important, but so is an opening. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to now tell you about the best first chapter ever written. It was a dark and stormy night. And we're in the middle of a very spooky forest. And there's a lightning storm going. There's lightning coming down and rain. And in the middle of this forest is a spooky mansion. And the, in the window of the spooky mansion, we see a frail damsel. And she's walking back and forth with a candle. And her hand is shaking because she's so terrified. And the reason that she has a candle is because the storm has put out all the electricity. And the reason that she's scared to death is that the last thing she heard on the television before it went out was that a maniac from the hospital for the criminally insane who had been put there for chopping up frail young damsels who were in isolated mansions has just escaped from the lunatic asylum. And now we pan down into the forest. And there's the maniac still in his uh, uh, straitjacket that he had ripped open when he escaped. And he's got a meat cleaver in his hand, and it's dripping blood. And he sees the frail damsel, and he goes, eh, 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 and begins creeping towards the mansion. Paragraph break. Now it's the morning. Sun's come out. There's yellow crime scene tape over all over the mansion. And the detective who's going to solve the case drives up just as they're putting the body bag in the back of the ambulance. And he tells him, wait a minute, I want to see the victim. And he opens up the body bag, and in it is the serial killer. Now, why is that the best first chapter ever written? Because <clears throat> the reader is going to start reading this and saying, oh, God, I have seen this stupid plot five million times. There's going to be the killer is going to chop up the girl. And then 10 years later, a sorority is going to have a party in the mansion and some lunatic in a ski mask is going to go and kill everybody. And then all of a sudden you say, wait a second, it's a serial killer. It's not the frail young damsel. What went on here? And so what I try to do early on in the book is to get the reader to draw conclusions and once they draw these conclusions and then they're wrong, the next thing they're going to do is say, whoa, I don't trust my judgment. And, that time, and at that point, you can manipulate the reader any way you want. So you could have a big page in there with big red letters that say, hey, the, the killer's the butler. And the reader's going to say, uh, uh you know, you fooled me once. I'm sure it's not the butler because you're telling me it's the butler. Well, then it could be the butler or it's not the butler. But you've got your uh, reader going back and forth and not really sure of their ability to figure out the plot. Uh, the biggest thing you want to do with a first chapter is to get the reader to say, I wonder 
what's going to happen next? Because if they say that to themselves, they'll want to read the book. Uh, there's, I always point out when I'm lecturing about writing, the best first chapter in a real book I've ever read was in a, 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 a civil action, uh, Jonathan Har, and it's nonfiction. And at the, in the first chapter, there's a lawyer, and he's been working on a case, I think it's for 10 years. And the, the lawyer comes out of his house just as the tow truck, the repo man, have dra are dragging his Porsche away. And this is the day that the judge, after 10 years, is going to make a decision on the case. And if the judge rules in favor of the lawyer's clients, he's going to be a multimillionaire from the settlement. But if he, they rule for the defendants, he will be bankrupt and won't have a penny. And so you have to read that book to find out if he gets his Porsche back. And it's just, you know, you say, oh, my God, what's going to happen? And then, of course, there's a flashback to the beginning of the case, and you don't know what happens until the very end. But once you read that chapter, you say, oh, my God, what's going to happen next? And so you start turning those pages because you're compelled to read till the end. Okay, so now I've got my first, I, I've got my, first chapter, I've got the reader hooked, I've got my ending, so I know the reader's going to be happy at the end of the book, and now I've got my outline. And now what I do is I just go and take every paragraph in my outline and make it into a chapter. Now, I don't worry about quality. The idea with the, the draft, first draft, is most first drafts are pretty awful. They're not publishable quality. But all I want to do once I got that outline finished is to get everything out of my head on paper. So when I finish writing the first draft, I really consider it to be a 400-page outline. It's the outline, but it's just bigger. And then I spend uh, months and months rewriting for quality, which I'll get into in a minute. The way I rewrite is, uh, the way I work on the editing part is this. Uh, <clears throat> when I, let's say I'm starting a new novel today and I write five chapters, or pardon me, five pages. The next morning when I boot up my computer, I will read those five pages because usually the first time you write someone, something that's awful, you, you don't, you're not, you're thinking about too many things. What's the next sentence going to be? Uh, what, how is this going to tie in with chapter two? So your quality is probably not very good. And uh, my, every time I do it, I say, oh, my God, did I write that? That's, that's awful. So then I spend time editing the first five pages, and then I write the next five. The next morning, I go back to page one, reread the first ten pages, and edit. Then I write another five pages. And when I get to the end of a chapter, I stop working on the edits for chapter one. Then I start the process with chapter two. Now, when I get to 100 pages, what I do is I print out the 100 pages and I read them as if I had paid money for the book. And I then go through, and it usually takes me a couple of days to read those first 100 pages critically and to make changes. Then I put the changes on the computer, and I write the next 100 pages. When I get 200 pages written, I print it out, and I go back to page one again, and I read all the way through. Then I go 300, et cetera. Uh, the advantage of this is by the time I've got, you know, 400 pages written, I have edited the first maybe 250 pages extensively. And uh, it really helps to not have to really do exhaustive editing for the whole book because you've been editing all along. Okay, so now I said I'm editing and I'm rewriting, but what is rewriting? Now, the real key to good writing is rewriting. Um, Every page in one of my books, as I said, has probably been rewritten 16, 17 times. And it's hard to explain what rewriting is 
because it's most people think it's like changing red to crimson or putting in commas. Um, but it's not that at all. It's, it's thinking about your book in a different way. Now, as I mentioned, I think my first two books were written in the 70s on a typewriter before they had computers. And I was teaching a creative writing class at the Portland Art Museum. And I got the bright idea of saving all the first pages of The Last Innocent Man, which is the book that I had been working on most recently. And fortunately, because I wasn't doing it on a computer, I had this stuff. And uh, I'm now going to read you the first pages of this book over and over and over again. Um, I actually have culled it down because I think I had about 50 when I started. Uh, this is going to get really boring for you at a certain point, but stick with me because there is a surprise ending. And uh, the surprise ending comes when you will, when I get to the, the, the first page that was actually published. So pay attention to what's going on. If you start getting bored, just suck it up and stick with me. Uh, okay, chapter one. <clears throat> when David looked up from his notes, Mr. Seals was stroking the back of his wife's right hand. David was touched by the act. The elderly gentleman had not looked at his wife or stopped talking, so the touching must have been reflective. Now, a lot of this writing, by the way, I should tell you, is really bad. But again, it's stuff that I that I threw out. I didn't keep it. But so if 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 I read a real stinker of a paragraph, they'll say, "That Margolin, I'm, I'm turning this thing off. He doesn't know how to write at all." So so again, a lot of this stuff I recognize as being pretty bad, and that's why I edited it. Okay, <clears throat> chapter one. When David looked up from his notes, Mr. Seals was stroking the back of his wife's right hand. David was moved. There had been no lapse in the conversation, and David was sure that the old man had not looked at his wife, so the touching must have been an unconscious act of love. It signified the bond that tied the elderly couple together and underlined their anguish. David had liked Mr. and Mrs. Seals immediately and felt sorry for them. They were elegant, straight-backed, and conservative. They were old money, and the son they had adopted late in life was sitting in the county jail charged with attempted murder. They didn't know how to handle that. The media had nicknamed David the Iceman because of his unruffled appearance in court, but the description was inaccurate. If anything, he was too emotional and the calm courtroom demeanor had been developed for protection. It was his sensitivity to the feelings of others that affected him now as he watched Mrs. Seals nervously stroke her pearl necklace, fighting to hold back her tears. He was grateful when his intercom buzzed, giving him a chance to look away from the troubled couple. Judge McIntyre's bailiff is on one, his secretary said. I'll take it. David excused himself and swiveled his chair toward the phone. He knew why the bailiff was calling, and he felt slightly nauseous. This is David Nash. We have a verdict, Mr. Nash. The judge would like you to come right up. David's mouth was dry and he took a breath to calm himself. It was always the same, no matter how many times he heard those words. They were so final and despite his record of victories, they always left him with a feeling of despair. I'll get the doctor and be right up, he said, replacing the receiver. Chapter one, Judge McIntyre's bailiff is on one, David's secretary said. David released a button on his intercom and picked up the phone. Chapter one, the light on the intercom flashed and David Nash depressed the button. Judge Nakamura's bailiff is on line one, his secretary said. David's bolts quickened, but his voice remained calm. Chapter one. The intercom flashed and David excused himself, swiveling his chair until his back was to the elderly couple on the other side of the desk. The jury has a verdict, he heard his secretary say. He expected the words, but for a moment they did not register. It was his mind fighting for breathing space, giving the body time to absorb the implication. I told you some of this writing is really bad. Tell a judge five minutes, he said. His pulse was racing. No matter how long you were in the business, it was always the same. David took a deep breath before turning back to Mr. and Mrs. Seals. Chapter one. Now I have this marked as especially bad. The intercom flashed. David excused himself. The bailiff's on one. His pulse quickened. 
Tell him I'm on my way as soon as I can get in touch with Dr. Gall. Now, here's the bad part. The intercom light flashed off. David took a deep breath, then turned back to Mr. and Mrs. Seals. He did not want them to know how nervous he was. There was big business going on here. These people were going to pay him a lot of money to represent their son. And according to the media, the David Nash who represented Dr. Thomas Gall and a string of equally famous defendants didn't even sweat. They had come to him because of the media expecting magic, and he had to give them a sweatless man. <laughs> so, chapter one. The intercom buzz. David excused himself. Judge Nakamura's on. I'll take it. They have a verdict. I'll tell the judge. David replaced the phone and took a deep breath before turning back to Mr. and Mrs. Seals. <clears throat> he didn't want them to suspect his inner turmoil. They were conducting big business, big money was involved, and they would want a man who was calm during moments of great tension. I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave. That was the courthouse, and they have a verdict in Dr. Gault's case. That's perfectly all right, Mrs. Seal said. We understand, her husband added. David watched in tents the name of the young surgeon. Mrs. Seals fingered her pearl necklace while her husband shifted uneasily in his seat. They sensed they were present at the heart of an historical occasion. I'll arrange to see Tony as soon as possible, Nash said. You tell him not to discuss the case with anyone. I'm going to the jail, Mrs. Seal said, and then she paused, still stunned by the implications of that word, so alien in her inner world. Uh, skip this one. Skip this one trying to make this as painless as possible. <laughs> Skip this one. Okay, this one I have down is too cute. Chapter one. It was lion time in March and dark clouds had made the distant mountains disappear like a magician's sleight of hand fantasy. A cold and depressing rain fell on the river and sharp winds dashed large drops against David's uh, David's uh, office window. He felt as if the weather had been tailor-made to fit his mood. Across the desk, Mrs. Seals unconsciously stroked the back of his wife's right hand. Chapter one. And we're getting to the end, so hang in there. Ominous black clouds rolled across the foothills towards the city, and a cold and depressing March rain began to fall on the river. Banks, Kelton, Howard, Wine, and Nash occupied the 23rd floor of the new commercial trust building. Senior partners raided exterior offices while junior partners and associates may do with windowless interior offices. The north wall of David Nash's office was all glass. A sharp wind dashed the first large drops against it, and the elderly couple seated across from David stiffened as if the icy cold outside had seeped into the well-heated room. <clears throat> Chapter one, ominous black clouds rolled across the foothills towards the city and a depressing March rain began to fall on the river. Banks, Kelton, Howard, Scars, Dan Nash occupied the 23rd floor, blah, 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 blah. And the law firm of Chapter one, the law firm of Banks, Kelton, Howard, Scarston, and Nash occupied the 23rd floor of the new commercial trust building from his office high above Portsmouth. David could see storm clouds closing in. All right, so now I think I've tortured you enough. Uh, and now I'm going to read you, and here's our surprise ending. I'm going to read you the actual first page that was in the published novel, The Last Innocent Man and pay attention to what's not in it. Chapter one, David Nash could see the storm clouds closing in on Portland from his office on the 32nd floor of the first National Bank Tower. The rain would be a welcome relief from the June heat. The first large drops started falling on the river. David watched for a while and then turned his back to the window. Across the room, Thomas Galt shifted his position on the couch. The newspapers called David the Iceman because of his unruffled appearance in court, but Galt deserved the title. 
It was almost eight o'clock. The jury had been deliberating for two days, but Gall dozed, oblivious to the fact that 12 people were deciding whether he should be convicted of murder. The telephone rang and startled David. Galt opened his eyes. The phone rang again and David answered it. His heart was beating rapidly as he raised the receiver. Mr. Nash, Judge ba McIntyre's bailiff said, we have a verdict. David took a breath to calm himself. His mouth was dry. It was always the same, no matter how many times he heard those words. They were so final and despite his record of victories, they always felt left, left him with a feeling of despair. I'll be right over, David said, replacing the receiver. Galt was sitting up and stretching. Moment of truth, old buddy, he asked as he yawned. He seemed to be experiencing none of the tension that David felt. Moment of truth, David repeated. So what did I get rid of? Well, what was the important thing that creates tension in this scene? It is the fact that there is a verdict in a murder case. And we don't know if the client's going to be sentenced to death or, or acquitted or what's going to happen. So what I got rid of was the steals because the old couple detract from the actual focus of the, case, of the chapter, the thing that makes the reader say, gosh, I wonder what's going to happen next, which is, What's going to happen to Galt? Now, Galt is not in all of those other pages. Why is he in here? Because he is the focal point of this murder case. And I put him in real fast so you can meet him firsthand and see the contrast between my hero, David Nash, who is a brilliant defense attorney, but obviously has a lot of emotions wrapped up in this, and this guy that is waiting the verdict in a murder case and seems to be totally, you know, ice cold about it. So we learn very quickly in just a short paragraph about Nash, the defendant, and we hook the reader by, by having the reader say, oh my gosh, I got to keep reading to find out what's going to happen to the goal. The, the seals do come in, but I have the, their, their son's case as a minor part of the book. So why waste the reader's time with minor characters right off the bat? So you can see what is rewriting. Rewriting is taking the same scene and looking at it from different periods of time. Sometimes I started it with the weather. Sometimes I started it with the, with the uh, seals. Uh, interaction and what I what I found is that if you have three people in a scene sometimes if you write it from the viewpoint of a it's boring B it's boring but C it's really good and so what I do is I move my characters around I tell tell the scene from one person's point of view if that doesn't hit I say what if number two let's see what happens if they're the focus so it's moving the scene back and forth in time, starting it with the with the the uh, the the phone call from the court, starting it with a view of the river. I also got rid of all that uh, description of the the law firm with the senior partners' office. They have the big offices with the windows, and the smaller you know the associates have the little. We can do that later. That is just filler that doesn't that detracts from the action so you want to get to the reader right away you know when you're rewriting you want to get rid of stuff that slows down the pace of the book or the action um <clears throat> let me see i thought i had oh yeah so um last last piece of advice is um and then I'll get to questions if, if you have questions. Never write to get published or make money. And this is really, really important. Um, <clears throat> it takes a long time to write a book. And it is very difficult to get published. I, I talked to a lot of high school, junior high school classes, law school classes 
I'll come in sort of comedy relief and talk about writing. And I always start off by saying never, ever, ever think about a career as a writer because it's almost impossible to get published. And if you do, you don't make money. They did two studies uh, 10 years apart, and I think there was even a recent one, and they all came to the conclusion that the average published writer who got an advance made $5,000 a year. So that's below the poverty line. And this is factoring in, you know, $8 million advances for Stephen King and John Grisham. Um, <clears throat> and then again, as I said, it's very, very difficult to even get published. But that's the bad news. The good news is you can't be a writer and do brain surgery or do death penalty murder cases as a hobby, but you can be a bus driver, a school teacher, a lawyer, and write. And so if you love to write, write. And just do it for the fun with no expectation that you'll ever get published or make a cent out of it. Then, if you get lucky like I did, at some point, if you write a book that is publishable, uh, you get into print. And I've been very fortunate to have books, you know, almost every one of my books on the New York Times list. So I can support myself. But I never go into this thing. Um, I mean, it's actually, even though I've been doing it since full time since 1993, basically, 96, basically. Uh, whenever I sit down, I'm writing because it's so much fun. I just can't wait to get to the office every day. I can't imagine any other thing that would be more fun than writing. And I love it. And that should just be the reason you're doing it because it's just really great fun. And, you know, I always tell people, you know, why do you play golf? You know, I play golf. I love golf. I'm not very good at it. I'm never going to make a penny of it. What I do, because it's fun. I like to do it. I like being in the fresh air. And I actually have to pay to play golf. So I do it because it's fun. And that's the same reason that I write, because I really enjoy it. When I started out, I had no idea that I was ever going to make a penny. But it was just such an interesting and challenging way to spend the day that, that I just did it. And that should be your goal, just to have a blast doing it. So now if there are any questions, I would love to take questions. Well, I'm going to ask one real quick, and then we'll um, we'll see if Kelly has one. Um, I just started listening to your interview with uh, Renee Denfeld at Literary Arts a couple years ago. I think you were at like Book Fest. Um, what? How do you? Or are you familiar with National Novel Writing Month during the month of November? I, I know what it is. So yeah, you, where you, you take a, you write a novel in a month. Yeah. So yeah. how do you feel about stuff like that? I've tried participating a couple times and I actually felt like it was too much pressure. Oh, you know, again, you should go into it the same way that I Have go fun. into golf. Yeah. It's a fun thing to do. Uh, you put pressure on yourself. That's true. You know, I love law school. I was one of like the few people that really loved law school and I had so many of the people, I went to one of the top law schools where people were, you know, getting ulcers and freaking out because they didn't get an A or something. And I just never cared about grades. I really enjoyed law school. I went in and I figured I'd do my best and let the chips fall. And I think that's a good way to approach life. You know, yeah. uh, when I tried murder cases, I would go in. I mean, this is where a guy could die, you know, and I was very conscientious. I never had a guy go on death row. Uh, when I was representing them. I had about 12 death penalty cases. But I never went in to win the case. I never went in with any pressure. My whole thing is you try to do your best and just let the chips fall. If, if, you're, you know, if you're concentrating on winning or you got to write that book and finish it, mm -hmm. you'll get an ulcer. But if you go in and say, oh, this is fun. Let me see what I can do in a month. And then you'll have fun. And if you finish the book, you finish the book. If you don't finish the book, you don't finish. So I, I think it's a fun activity. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I think it's an it's a enjoyable way to spend time. But again, never, you know, go into it with the idea that I probably won't finish a book in a month. I'll give it my best shot and see what happens. Yeah, for sure. Well, Kelly, I'm going to unmute you for a second. and Or actually, here, I think you'll have to unmute yourself. 
but do you have a question for our author? Yes, I would love to ask a question. Um, actually, I was really happy to hear you say that you plot everything out because I feel like it's really trendy these days to talk about how <laughs> organic everything is. So when you're doing um, twits, I was interested you were talking about getting the reader to draw a conclusion, which I guess is what then leads to the twist. Do you plot all those out? Do you write to them or do they come to you as you're doing it? Well, again, and I know this is the big debate, outline, don't outline. You know, I've heard people lecture and say, you should never outline because I just write and if I'm surprised and the reader will be surprised. Well, uh, what I would be terrified about is spending five years writing without an outline and then finding that I don't have an ending for my book because I didn't think it out. So then you don't have a book. You have 500 pages of stuff and, or you, you finish the book with a really dumb outline with a dumb ending because you didn't really think it out and your reader is really excited about your fabulous book gets to the end says, God, this is so stupid. And then they, they bad mouth your book. With the outline, uh, I am working on the twists and turns, okay? So as I do talk myself through the outline, I will say, okay, I got to plant a four, false clue here, red herring here, but I'm going to put the actual clue that leads you to figure out who the killer is. Because I, I know my ending. I know who the bad guy is and how they're going to get caught, okay? So I know that Bill, you know, the butler is a killer, and he's going to get caught because he's left-handed, and he's the only left-handed guy in the whole story. So where do I put the fact that he's left-handed in? Okay, let me put that in Chapter 3 when he, you know, picks up, he, he signs a check or something. And then I don't mention it anymore. Then, okay, so I want to distract people from that. So maybe I'll have a just as he signed the check with his left hand, there's an explosion outside. Okay, I'll put that because I don't want the reader to, to focus on the fact that he's shining, signing the check with his left. So I better put a gunfight in there or something happening to distract the reader. Okay, now I have to figure out something that will point the reader to, to, the, to the cook or the chambermaid. So... Where, where, where am I going to put that? You know, okay, I think I'm going to drop the fact that the chambermaid had escaped from the hospital for the criminally insane. So now we got the reader thinking it's the chambermaid and I'm distracted. So that's what I do as I'm working on my outline. I'm thinking, okay, this is the clue that's going to lead to the killer, but how do I disguise the clue so it's not too obvious and where do I put in stuff that'll make the reader think someone else is the killer? So that's, that's what I do. Now, just a comment about this not outlining. Um, <clears throat> I thought a lot about that. And, you know, I think maybe it's semantics because let's say you say, I'm not going to do an outline and you write a 400 page book. Well, really what you've done is you've skipped my step and you've got a 400 page book that's really an outline. It's just a big outline. So you've been working on the book um, and you're really doing the same thing. It's taking the time to figure out where things go. And I'm assuming as you're just writing without outlining, you're making changes in the book as you go along. Uh, what I like about doing it in an outline is this idea of spending all day long thinking and not writing. Because when I do that, I keep on getting new ideas, spot problems that I hadn't spotted before, uh, before I've done a lot of extra work. So, you know, but there's a whole school of thought that you don't outline. And quite frankly, I've read a lot of books where I wish they had because, again, you get this fabulous, usually all books start off with a great idea. You know, that's the part where that people get excited about. That's their, their first, you know, what gets them started on the book in the first place. 
but not taking the time to get the ending that's just as smart as your super duper idea. I think it just kills your book. And I've seen books like that. Maybe they're written under a deadline or something where the guy gets the idea. He's got to have it finished in a, in a year, speeds through, can't really think about a good ending in that one year period and then puts out a piece of garbage. So for me, as a matter of honor, I think I have a contractual obligation with my reader. If I'm going to ask you to pay money for my book, I better have a really good finished product. So any that other? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, that's interesting that you say that too. So as an editor, I don't often think about that and I don't know why I hadn't. I myself as a writer, am a little bit more of a pantser where I just am like, I'll sit down and write today. But I have the beginnings of like four or five different things and nothing past that. But I notice as an editor, <clears throat> I'm making an outline as I'm editing because I wanna make sure that timeline is flowing, that a character's name hasn't just changed, that suddenly somebody's doing something that doesn't fit in the world that it is happening in this. So I like to think that you having this outline and doing the rewriting that you're doing, you're doing so much self-editing that, that helps that next person, because I'm sure you have editors and you, you know, either through your publisher or anything, but that's something um, I'm thinking that a lot of uh, first-time authors might not realize is that self-editing is, is very difficult because you've seen it so many times that you don't, you think it sounds great. And then an, an editor gets to it and I'm like, Shh, flashing things. <laughs> well, I, I have actually, I love editors. Um, if you read the acknowledgments, I always credit my editors with making the book much better. And that's just not brown nosing. That's a fact. Um, I try to send my editor at my publishing house as complete a manuscript as I can produce. So usually my first thing is I send my at some point, I just finish, I get, you know, I say, oh, God, I can't, all I'm doing is putting commas in. I can't, you know, I've done everything I can with this draft. Then I send it in to my agent, who's a brilliant editor, and she's my first read. If she thinks the book is good enough to go to New York or to go to the, pardon me, to the editor in, at, at St. Martin's, She'll, do, she'll just forward it. But if she sees some major problems, we talk it out yeah. and I'll take the book back and I'll rewrite it. So hopefully um, when my editor in New York gets it, it's pretty polished. Yeah. But uh, I just finished editing my 24th book, uh, Matter of Life and Death, which will come out next March. So uh, it went back twice to New York and I uh, went went with um, my agent. She liked it enough. There's just a couple of minor things. Then I spent weeks doing the edits. My, my editor took about a month to work on it, sent it to me. I took about probably two weeks solid work going through his comments. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time I, I make the changes he suggests. Sometimes I disagree. We just have a civilized discussion because the objective is uh yet you can't have any ego i forgot to mention this. you can't have any ego in your work you know you're i'm writing to try to make you happy when you're flying from portland to new york uh you know to so you say oh boy this was a fun book so that's what i'm writing for i'm not writing for me and uh anyone who can help me out to make the book better i appreciate and I've really, Keith Kale at St. Martin's a terrific editor, does a really good job. I would say 90% of the comments, I, I, I make the changes. Sometimes we disagree and I'll, we'll talk it out. Uh, so I went back to New York. He took another couple of weeks working on it, sent it back. Um, it took me about five or six days to go through the re-edits and now it's done. So. Uh, the editing process doesn't end with me, mm -hmm. you know, it ends because uh, I, you know, I always sort of joke, 
I do everything I can do with the book. Then I send it to New York and they beat the hell out of me for another, you know, couple of months. Uh, but I like it. Yeah. And I, when I have an editor, new editor, and some, you know, I realize sometimes because I'm a New York Times bestselling author, sometimes an editor might get intimidated. He doesn't know, can I, am I going to get upset with criticism? So the first thing I always tell them with the new editors, please don't tell me anything you like about the book. Because mm. if you like it, it's working. I want to know, A, what you don't like. B, I want to know why you don't like it. You know, and then I want to get any suggestions you might have to fix the problem. And then my job is to not get all upset because someone's saying I'm, I didn't write something well. It's to listen with an open mind and then make a decision on whether I agree or disagree. And again, like I said, 90% of the time I, I agree with the, with the editor. If I disagree, we just have a real conversation where I'll say, you know, uh, Keith, I know you think it should be this way, but here's why I think it should be this way. What do you think? And we'll talk it out. That's awesome. Kelly, did so you is that the first time? I do. I'm going to sneak in one more. Is that the first time your agent and editor would see the book then, or do you ever talk to them in the beginning when you're actually coming up with the concept of the book? No, no. I, <clears throat> I, you know, I, I have on occasion sent the outline in, but usually I just write the book and then let it, because I want them to be, uh, you know, if they know the butler did, it sort of kills some of the, you know, kills the suspense when you're reading it. So, <clears throat> pardon me. So usually what I do is get the book written and then send it to New York, uh, to my agent. And and the, I never discuss it with with. Uh, sometimes they'll they'll want like a one uh, like when you're doing a new new uh, contract, they'll sometimes want a summary of the first book in the contract, mm. uh, just you know like a one page deal. So it's usually not. I mean I've been this like I said I've been doing this so long that that they're going to give me the contract. So I it's just you know it's not like I'm a new guy. Uh, but it's a formality that they want to know that, you know, I actually have an idea. So, um, but usually my, my New York, the editor at St. Martin's doesn't see it until my agent ships it. And again, when she sends it over, we've done as, I try to do as much work as I can so that it's polished so that he doesn't have to do, I want to cut down the amount of work he's got to do. So I want to send as polished a book as I can because he's got a lot of other people to work with. So I don't want him to have to, you know, spend years on my book because it's such a crappy first draft. So I want to, I want to get it as good as I can get it. So to save him time. So. So. Any other questions? Um, well, I actually, so I, this just, you were talking about an empathetic character, but I'm wondering how you feel about books that don't and one that comes to mind i was talking about it with someone today is catcher in the rye mm -hmm. golden caulfield's not you don't really like him but how do you feel about those where the book is you don't necessarily like the main character it's, i'm not talking about liking oh okay i'm talking like, about being able to relate okay it's been a long time since i've read catcher in the rye yeah, so same uh like <clears throat> college or high school or whatever but it's, I'm, I'm not talking about empathetic from the standpoint that you like the character. Okay. It's putting some character trait into this character that a, that a reader can relate to. Yeah. So maybe if he's a serial killer, he was abused as a child. Right. You know, something in there that makes you want to find out what happens to the character. Okay. So it's not a question of making the person likable. Right. It's, 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 it's giving, doing something that helps the reader relate to that character uh, and recognize that this is a real, these are real problems or things that, that at some point, you know, you, you had something similar happen just so you can, you know, get, gee, I wonder what's going to happen, you know, 
to this to this guy or this woman. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you. Um, so Kelly, I know you joined us a, a few minutes late. I'm actually recording this and I'm going to be putting it on the bookstore's YouTube channel. So if you want to catch the first part of it, it'll be under the Roundabout Books YouTube account. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So, and thank you so much for joining us. So, um, Phil, thank you so much for taking the time. And I think that you did amazing at a Zoom event. This was... <laughs> great and I'm so excited to share it with some authors that I know that couldn't join us tonight so you know again um, thank you for teaching us something about novel writing yeah I thought it'd be a little different from what I usually do so uh, uh, <clears throat> it's such a weird time and you know for, yeah. there are people out there that are thinking of working on a book because they're self-quarantining or whatever this mm -hmm. this might give them a couple of pointers on on uh, how to get through it so yeah well excellent I look forward to reading uh, your current book and the next one that'll come out and fingers crossed that when that next one comes out we can have you back down at the store yeah it's much I mean I much yes. prefer to be down there and it's it, I've always been enjoyed you know uh, in person I'm actually gonna do an in-person book event at a uh, Sun River Books and Music tomorrow night Oh, awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. And when you are back at Polina Springs, too, we'll have to come by. You Polina Springs, I'm doing a, a Zoom event yeah, yeah. that's going to be uh, sent out to a bookstore in, Mo in Montana and Seattle. Yeah. So that'll be interesting, too. And I, I'll probably do my usual talk about the book because these are, yeah. well, you know what I mean? I've been around about a number of times, and so a lot of, I always worry that people, because I have a book almost every year, that people have heard the story, my weird story of how I got published and how I became a best-selling author, which is equally weird. So, but the one in Montana and Seattle are places I haven't talked, so I'm probably doing my usual uh, book event there. Well, that's awesome, but I just thank you so much for supporting indie bookstores. I know you've done, you know, great stuff for us at Roundabout, for Lane at Polina Springs, and we just really appreciate um, your continued support. So yeah, I love independent books. Independent bookstores have been so good to me over the years, and uh, I'm just terrified that between Amazon and Barnes and Noble and coronavirus and this, that, and the other thing, that they're going to become an endangered species. So. I'm holding my breath that your bookstores will, you know, are you open now? Are we are. Um, Roundabout had stayed open in a, um, in a different capacity. We were doing porch pickup and um, deliveries to people's doorsteps, but not in person. Um, and we're back open in the store with a limited amount of people in at a time. Uh, but we are going to hold off on events just because we've seen some spikes in Oregon. So we just want to make sure we're not contributing sure. to that. So. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, thanks yeah. for inviting me to do this. And Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Kelly. Everybody have a great night. Hey, Kelly, thank go out and write a book. Yeah. I will. <laughs> I'm excited. All right. Write book and write a book. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.